my life is a miracle. Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story. Hello, welcome to Shalom World. My name is Peter Van Kampen. In this 9 p.m. talk series, tonight's session is Light in the Darkness. I want to start out by sharing an anecdote of a time that I found myself in almost perfect darkness and very much afraid. I'm a missionary. I have traveled to Mexico and Kenya and Tanzania doing missionary work with a group called Renewal Ministries. On one occasion, when I was in Kenya, I was in a city called Malindi. Now, this was my first time going to a very poor country. I come from Calgary in Canada. It's a wealthy city. I moved and went to the city in Malindi, and I was giving talks all day to people about God loves you, God wants to provide for you. But I felt conflicted about the fact that I live in luxury while the people that I was speaking to about God's love by and large, lived in poverty. And so what happened was I just needed to deal with this, this conflict that I was feeling. So one evening, I requested of my supervisor, I said, look, I don't wanna go to the restaurant with the rest of the missionaries. Could you give me enough money that I can buy a meal? But I just need to be alone. I just need to pray. And so I did. I went from the hotel down to the beach. We were on the Indian Ocean there. And I stood on the beach. I stood in the waves, actually. And I prayed a very powerful, very intimate prayer with God. When I was done praying, I decided I did need to find a place to have a meal, so I walked down the beach and I found a place that was selling donairs. I went into the place, I had my donair, and, or something like a donair, and after I was done eating, I walked out and lo and behold, while I was inside, the sun had set. This was something that I had not anticipated. You see, in Melindi, there's a fair amount of crime. And I sometimes would feel like I might be a target as a white man who was going to be considered wealthy in this touristy city. And I thought, do I want to walk from the Donair place back to my hotel down a lonely stretch of beach where if anything happened to me, nobody would even see it? And so I thought to be safe, it would probably be better if I walked through town. Well, like I say, I grew up in Calgary. Calgary is a very well-lit city. It's always bright, even at night. Melindy, not so much. They did not have a lot of street lights. And so it was very, very dark. And I found myself very afraid. I couldn't see people until they were right in front of me. I remember at one point, these two ladies approached me and they were right in front of me before I even noticed they were there. At another point, I heard a gate slam behind me and I spun around and there was a man trying to get something out of my backpack. I hadn't heard him. I hadn't seen him. He was right there. And so I became more and more afraid. At one point, I thought, am I getting close to the hotel? And I came around the corner and there before me was the Donair place that I had started at. And so I grew more afraid. Now look, Eventually, I did find my way back to the hotel and I was safe, I didn't get robbed, <laughs> nothing bad really happened, but it was my fear in the darkness that stuck with me. You see, darkness is often used as an allegory for sin. Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind. He talked about being a light in the darkness and he said that we ourselves are to be light in the darkness. The Catholic Church teaches that when we sin, our intellect is darkened, right? We know that we have this thing called concupiscence, where we have this unnatural desires for things that are not good, right? And, and so we have this, this kind of twisting of our nature. Our intellect is darkened, and we don't even recognize the light anymore. 
There are some animals in the world. There are these, you know, Texas cave salamanders, right? These animals that live in caves where they've lived there for so long, for so many generations, that they've adapted to being in perfect darkness. So these salamanders I just mentioned are, are white, right? And then there's crabs that are white. There are these fish, right? And these animals kind of get into these caves and then for generations they live in there, they adapt to the darkness and eventually they lose their eyes. They, do, they don't anymore have the ability to see. This is what happens to us in the darkness of sin. We no longer recognize what is good because we've so long lived in this darkness. I wrote uh, a novel some time ago. It was called Luke's. It's never been published, so don't go looking for it. But I wrote this novel. It was a science fiction novel. And in it, the main character goes to this other planet called Luke's, L-U-X for light. He goes to this other planet called Luke's. And in my novel, it's, it's a rogue planet. Like it doesn't, it doesn't actually go around a sun. It's just kind of going off on its own. I don't know if those things are real. But I wanted to create this planet because it's all an allegory. It, the planet itself is in darkness, but everything on the planet is bioluminescent. So it's getting its energy from this mineral on the planet, and it's all bioluminescent, which means it is all lit up because every living organism is bioluminescent, right? Lit up from the inside. And so there's this people-like species on the planet, which I called Sutinimus. These people are themselves lit up interiorly. And so what they've done is they've got this adaptation where in order to see, they have to be lit up themselves. But on the planet, there is this dark ocean, this dark water. And what happens is if the people or if any creature on the planet touches this dark water, it stains them. And now they are no longer luminescent. They become kind of blackened and they can no longer perceive things properly. And so this was the analogy for sin. Now, of course, later on in the novel, this character is going to come in. What's going to happen is there's actually going to be a disaster where there's going to be an earthquake and a tsunami. And so this black water wave is going to overtake the land and everyone and everything will be stained and the whole planet will be plunged into darkness. But eventually, a person will come, a man who is still bioluminescent, and he will teach them how to how to be restored to the light that they were originally intended to be. Now, obviously, like I say, this whole novel is an allegory. Um, that man of light represents Christ. But see, what happened was Christ is the light that came into the world because he was never darkened by sin. And sometimes we don't recognize him. We don't recognize goodness because we've lived in the darkness of sin for so long that when we see light, we don't even perceive it like the Texas cave salamander. We can't even perceive it. What needs to happen is the light needs to shine into the darkness and purify us so that we also become light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. In order to be what Christians are meant to be in the world, you know, I remember when I was a kid, we used to sing these songs. Our, our Catholic schools would go to church and we'd sing these songs. We are the light of the world. And we had these songs, but what makes us the light? It is Christ shining in us and shining through us. We're not the light simply because we are Christians, right? If we are no different from the rest of our culture, we're not shining light in the darkness that is our culture. Jesus said this when he was talking about us being the salt of the earth. He said, if salt is not salty, what good is it? It's not good for anything. It should just be thrown on the ground and trod underfoot. This is what we as Christians, if we're supposed to be salt and we're supposed to be light, it means we're supposed to be something different that is in our culture, something that transforms our culture. So Jesus said that we're to be the light of the world and we're to be the salt of the earth. And he said about salt, what good is salt if it is not salty? It's not good for anything, right? It's, it's to be thrown on the ground. It's to be trod underfoot. What difference does it make? Christ has called us to be the light of the world. Are we different from the rest of society? I feel personally convicted by this, right? When I'm on social media, if I'm on Facebook and I see people being nasty to each other about politics and they're being critical and they're being angry, 
Am I a light in that darkness? When I, as a Christian, say, I'm going to speak the truth, I need to be a witness to the truth in this area where our minds are darkened by sin. When I say I'm going to bring the light of truth, am I a light in the darkness? Am I being kind or am I being nasty like everybody else? Right? When, when we talk about our need to take care of the poor, remember how I said I was convicted that we should care more for the poor and I was living in luxury. Do I, as a Christian, live differently from the rest of my culture? Or am I being conformed to my culture? Scripture tells us that Jesus is the light of the world. It says the light has come into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. In John 1 verse 5. Jesus is the light of the world. He came into the world at a time in history when the world was dark when most people were not worshiping the one true God. And the false gods that they were worshiping, they were afraid of. And people were mistreating each other, and there were slaves, and there was warfare. And Jesus came as the light into the world, but then he did something else. He appointed us as Christians to also be light in the world. See, to be a Christian means to be a little Christ. So if Christ is the light that came into the world, the one anointed by the Holy Spirit to bring light into darkness, then we as Christians are also to bring that light into the darkness. Jesus said that we are to be the light of the world, and he said we are to be the salt of the earth. And then he says, look, if, if you have a light and you put it under a bushel basket, what good is that? It doesn't shine for anybody. And if you have salt, and that salt isn't salty, what good is it? It doesn't do anything. You just throw it on the ground. You trod it underfoot. A lot of times we Christians, we're like light under a bushel basket. Or we're like salt that is not salty. I remember when I was a kid, we used to, we used to go to mass with, with my school. I went to a Catholic school. We'd go to church, and at church we'd sing songs about, we are the light of the world. And we'd all sing about how we're the light of the world. Were we? Are we, as Christians, am I any different? Am I bringing light where there is darkness? You know, a lot of people right now are fearful in the world. Am I bringing hope where there is fear? A lot of people are nasty, especially right now. People are noticing it. We're becoming more and more polarized. Think about your own experiences on social media. For me, the one I use is Facebook. And I see people on Facebook and they're getting nastier and nastier to each other. And there is a temptation for me as a Christian. I think, well, I am the light. I'm going to bring the truth into this conversation. I'm going to teach the true things. But the temptation for me is to become angry, to go just as low as they do, hit below the belt. Am I being a light in that environment? Or I spoke before about my conviction that we're to live differently, right? I talked about how, how I felt guilty speaking to people who lived in poverty while I know I live in luxury. Do I live any differently than the rest of my culture, really, because I'm a Christian? Because if I'm just like everyone else, then I am salt that is not salty. I am a light that is put under a bushel basket. We as Christians cannot be like the rest of our culture. Romans 12, 2 says this, Do not be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Christ is the light of the world. Christ is the light in the darkness. This is the message of Christianity. If you've ever been to an Easter Vigil Mass, something profound will happen. You enter the church, and the church should be completely dark. I think it's too bad in nowadays age, you know, that we have electric lights. They try to make the church completely dark, but there's a bright red exit sign over there. Imagine if they could capture this perfectly. The church is completely dark. And then outside the doors of the church, they light this new fire, this, and then they bring in this candle, and so a light comes into the darkness. And then everybody's got their taper candles and they all light it off each other. And as that happens, the darkness is diminished and the light is increased. It's a beautiful allegory for what Jesus said, right? Jesus is the light in the darkness and in the Gospel of John it says, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
As Christians, let us be a light. Let's not anymore conform to the ways in which our culture thinks, the ways in which our culture behaves. Let us be a light in the darkness, and may our light come from Christ himself. I'm going to close us in a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy God, I want to thank you for the light of faith that we have as Christians, the light of hope. I pray, Lord, that we as Christians would be witnesses to the light when we step into the dark places in our culture. I pray that we as Christians would be convicted to live differently from our culture, that we would be aware that we are the light. Holy Spirit, enkindle in us that fire so that we can diminish the darkness and that the darkness will not overcome the light. We pray this to Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. been encouraged by what I've seen of Shalom Media and the uh, sorts of events that they promote uh, across Canada. We hear our Holy Father speaking often about a new evangelization for today's world. That is going to call for media, modern media, to be involved in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. So we ask the Lord to bless Shalom Media and all of your efforts to bring the good news into homes, into people's lives. Amen. Amen.